episode 65 of School Librarians United. I am your host, Amy Herman. This podcast is dedicated to the issues and challenges school librarians face every day. As a school librarian, currently in my 13th year, I found myself asking the question, where is the podcast that will help me do my job? I wanted a podcast which addressed the nuts and bolts of running a successful library program. I don't claim to have the answers, but I hope that this is a platform to share resources and exchange ideas. Now is a perfect time to mention that all the ideas and opinions expressed in this podcast by myself, by my interview guests, and listeners who contact the podcast are our own and do not reflect those of our school districts. When incorporating research, I always make sure to cite my sources. So whether you are a novice or a veteran school librarian, this podcast has something for you. I'd like to extend a very special welcome this week to listeners Lorraine in Australia, Jane in New Zealand, Melissa in Connecticut, and Mari in California. Mari has the noted distinction of being the very first listener to ever reach out to the podcast and give feedback, which was quite a while ago. I am forever grateful. She did reach out recently and pointed out that she liked season one, which were mostly episodes of just me and the microphone. Well, Mari, for reasons which will become abundantly apparent very soon, today's episode is just that, me and my microphone. I welcome you and all listeners to reach out with your feedback, questions, episode suggestions, either on Facebook or Twitter, or the email address schoollibrariansunited at gmail.com. If you include your mailing address, I will be sure to send you a podcast sticker. Before I dive into today's topic, tech tools for us, I'd like to address recent world events which have impacted each and every one of us to varying degrees. For the first time since I started podcasting in August of 2018, I finally have an issue which I could build episode upon episode because every single one of us, our libraries and our programs, are being impacted by COVID-19. That being said, I want to take this opportunity to share this platform whenever I can to support school librarians. I was very fortunate because this morning, a listener was kind enough to reach out to the podcast and share her remote learning lessons. I will be including a link in the show notes. Jess wrote, My name is Jess. I am a K-4 librarian in New Jersey. I love your podcast and appreciate all the hard work you put into building a community for librarians. It can be an isolated job, and I love getting ideas and inspiration from others who are in the field. With that in mind, I know that many of us, not only here in New Jersey, but across the United States and the world, are in a scary and uncertain times. Here in New Jersey, we had two half days so that the teachers could make remote learning plans. I just found out that we are closed for at least next two weeks and will be teaching remotely. Although nobody has officially announced anything yet, I am certain we will be remote for much longer. In an effort to share with you and the librarian community that you serve, I am sharing my somewhat easy-to-manage plan for remote learning. I will be emailing this link to the parents of the kids I have should be seeing on that cycle day. Feel free to make a copy and adapt to your own needs and share with your listeners. I took out my personal information and district logins and thank Staying Cool in the Library Educator Community for her great resources. My plan is to just swap out different pages and assignments each week, but to keep this framework. Students and parents have to complete a quick Google form each day for accountability. Thanks for all you do. It means a lot to me when people recognize that the podcast is a resource for school librarians, and it's a great place to share out ideas and resources. And anytime you reach out to the podcast, I really appreciate it because I know that there are listeners who are also equally appreciative. No doubt, we have all been besieged by COVID-19 emails. We can't escape it on social media. Personally, I feel bombarded with the messaging regarding the coronavirus. There isn't an aspect of our lives which hasn't in some way been impacted by this pandemic, except for podcasting. Podcasters excel at social distancing. We generate episodes without ever leaving our homes. One of the emails I received this week was from the president of my podcast hosting platform called Libsyn. President Lori Sims wrote, quote, your voice and podcast can be a lifeline for many people. 
Podcasts deliver the comfort of a friendly and familiar voice at a time of some uncertainty and when personal contact and connections with communities may not be a possibility or an option for some. Your voice may become more important than ever in helping people feel connected. Whether providing a sense of community, informative content, or entertainment, each of you can be a lifeline for those affected in all parts of the world. End quote. This podcast is as much an escape for me as I hope it is for you. I posted on social media a while ago that a listening community is still a community, one which has the potential to support and reassure in the most unsettling of times. Good news. I'm not going anywhere. And with all the schools in Michigan on a mandatory three-week shutdown, I will have plenty of time to interview and post episodes. In the spirit of sharing, I would like to make this platform available. I posted on Twitter several days ago that I would like to extend this invitation to you. In the wave of cancellations of public gatherings and concerts and performances and conferences, it is likely that there are those of you who will not be attending your school library-related conferences planned in the upcoming months. I know how hard presenters work to prepare their presentations, typically starting 10 months to a year in advance of the conference. If you or anyone you know who is a school librarian and is unfortunately not presenting due to a canceled conference, please reach out to the podcast using the email schoollibrariansunited at gmail.com. I am happy to feature this presentation as an episode. We can arrange a Skype interview, share the presentation and resources with our listening community. And now for today's episode, Tech Tools for Us. Ten months ago, when I conceived of this episode, it was actually a proposal to a presentation I submitted to our ISTE affiliate in Michigan, McCall, the Michigan Association of Computer Users and Learning, and our annual conference, which is held every March. This is the largest ed tech conference in the state, approximately 5,000 educators, and I was delighted when my proposal, Time for Tech to Work for Us, was accepted. A link will be found in the show notes. I poured a lot of time and energy into creating a resource I knew I could not only present IRL in a conference to attendees, but also generate into a follow-up episode after the conference. In recent weeks, the coronavirus moved around the earth, and it reached the east and the west coast of the United States. It was inevitable that Michigan would be impacted. It was just a matter of time. Like many attendees, I checked my emails frequently, making sure the conference wasn't canceled, and I wrote lesson plans for the three days I would plan to be absent. The threat of COVID-19 was palpable, and attendance at Wednesday's pre-conference was notably diminished. We all sort of moved around the Expo Center with some trepidation. We were slathered in hand sanitizer, and we maintained a measure distance from one another. By Thursday, we were most definitely on borrowed time. Presenters were offered the option to present remotely via Zoom, and there were many sessions which were canceled. I was lucky to present in the afternoon and learned our school district had called us all back to attend mandatory staff meetings on Friday. The conference canceled the last day as I started my two and a half hour drive home. My intention had been to interview attendees during the conference, as I had in previous episodes which followed the conferences. That plan was scrapped because sharing a microphone when social distancing became the norm was not possible. Here is my presentation, Time for Tech to Work for Us. If you can, listen to the podcast and follow along with the presentation open on a screen. If not, be sure to visit the presentation which is included in the show notes for more information and links to each of the resources I mentioned today. When I attend McCall, especially when I'm presenting, I'm very aware that most of the presentations are designed for educators in the classroom, by and large. And I'm very sensitive to this. I really find 
there to be a lot of satisfaction in attending a session which is designed for school librarians. And okay, that's very selfish. So when I make proposals for McCall, they are going to have in mind school librarians first and foremost. And, you know, I realize maybe that's what our state conference is for when the school librarians get together, but I still like the idea that when I go to an ed tech conference, that somebody has considered the interests and the needs of attendees who happen to be school librarians. So when you use the app, which McCall created, you can sort by intended audience. And uh, the different distinctions would be administration and support staff, all audiences, all teachers, elementary, high school, higher ed, instructional, technology specialists or coaches, library media specialists, middle school, special education, and technical support. And I think that when I was searching by school librarian, I found that we were just oftentimes grouped with the other educators. And I really did want to create something this year that served our audience specifically. So um, what usually happens at McCall is that we learn about the technology and then apply it to our jobs as school librarians, not as educators in the classroom, but going back to this idea of the round, uh, the square peg in the round hole and the logo of my podcast, because every time I've been in a group situation, whether it's a staff meeting or it's a, a district meeting or it's a conference like McCall, I have had to take what I learn and then apply it to my own circumstances, which is in the school library. So this Uh, presentation which I gave is what I wanted to happen in. That is that I would look at technology through the lens of being a school librarian, putting our needs first and foremost, identifying the needs we have in our library, and then finding technology that would remedy those uh, challenges. So with each slide, I hope you see that I've identified the challenge and then matched a technology to support those challenges and things, obviously, which I've used in the past. But I also, in the bottom right-hand corner of each slide, I embedded a link to a uh, Google sheet. And this Google sheet is where I encouraged attendees, and I, I encourage you to, you have access to it as well, to visit and to embed your own solutions. If you have your own technology, which you think could address these challenges, by all means, write those in. Again, this conference was, by Thursday afternoon, pretty sparsely attended, so we didn't get a great deal of audience feedback, but that doesn't mean you can't uh, take advantage of that Google Sheet right now. Um, so my first challenge was staying organized, and I've shared this resource out with you before, but In staying organized, the number one tool which I use is Google Keep. And I use Google Keep because I'm able to also synchronize it with the app on my phone, the extension on my, uh, uh, the Google extension that I have on my computer. And then I make use of the different labels. You can create different labels for everything and you can give each note as many labels as you want. So I use Google Keep when I'm trying to keep track of my budget, uh, goals that I'm setting, because I if I cover multiple sc- schools, I'll have different particular um, uh, uh, building-centered goals. Uh, I have a calendar tabs, which I use, and so each month I would create a different uh, list for myself, and I did that all on Google Keep rather than using the calendar because I wanted to see them sort of at a glance. Uh, When I did my purchasing, I kept track of books that I wanted to buy, Uh, favorite web pages. You can uh, keep a list of your favorite web pages, resources. Uh, and I actually just created a label called COVID-19 because whenever I have to do something that is related to where we are in this space right now, I would label it with a COVID-19 uh, label in Google Keep. And that way, when I uh, go to, to generate something to share out with my families, I'll have it all located in one place. If you've never used Google Keep, it is a fantastic resource. And uh, I 
I can't say enough nice things about it because it really is to me a lifesaver. I have been able to organize just about every aspect of my life. My um, When people say, I don't know how you do it all and have a podcast, and I say, oh, well, the podcast has a Google Keep too. And so when I'm uh, generating and, and collecting resources for the different episodes I do, I create different labels for uh, my Google Keep, and it really has made a lot of things a lot easier. Also, when it comes to staying organized, I use Google Drive. I am convinced that if I can keep everything digitally, I'm never going to print another thing again. I don't print. Uh, I, I really try to avoid it. So when administrators send us calendars, when they send us schedules, when they send us agendas, anytime an administrator shares something with us, I have decided there's a Google folder I can put that in. I never need to print anything out. I think it was... Uh, a strategy I remember using years ago where if a, an administrator printed out the agenda, well, the first thing I do is print out my own copy and take notes on it. Well, that doesn't need to happen because I go to my meetings and I'm keeping notes on a Google Keep. And it really is has helped me stay organized. Um, I've also digitized anything I had in hard copy so that whereas I might have a decade ago had binders for each of my grade levels and the lessons that I was using, I now have a Google Drive and I have actually scanned a few things and then converted those into JPEGs where I could then modify them in a Google Draw. Uh, usually it was a Google Draw platform that worked for me. I also included on this page a link to Casey Bell's Shake Up Learning podcast and an episode she did called 13 Tips to Organize Your Google Drive. And I, for many reasons, I, I do really respect the work that Casey Bell has done when it comes to all things Google and she and Matt Miller, and I'll get to that in a minute. But the 13 tips to organize your Google Drive is even if you're somebody who's been using Google Drive for a long time, and, and I, I put myself in that category, I found that this was a really helpful sort of checklist. And even in my head, I was checking most of these things off and saying, yep, I do that. I do that. But it still was great to hear because it was very validating to know that I am doing the right things when it comes to making sure I stay organized. When it comes to classroom management, (laughs) there will be an episode on classroom management. I promise. Right now is not that day. But I do want to sneak this in. Some of my tricks for classroom management is to make sure that I have everything ready and accessible. And Google Slides is really fantastic. I included three links here and you can replicate and use all three of these. So the first one is a calendar. It's a Google Slide of many of the uh, reference images I use throughout the calendar year. And I like using this because in my classes that I teach, I do have a a sort of a classroom time and then a book checkout time. So when we are at the tables or we're sitting uh, on the risers, I'll have an image on the screen welcoming the students, which sort of sets the tone. And oftentimes those images are in this calendar. These are Images I use often, they, they give the, the students an idea of what we're going to be doing that day, or um, it's just helpful to have it all in one place. And then I embed this uh, slide uh, on a folder on my uh, toolbar, and I'll talk about that in a minute as well. I do include two slideshows, and these are fun. Um, the first one is a Return Your Books meme slideshow. And I find some classes are better than others when it comes to getting their books returned, But this particular slideshow is nothing but a scrolling marquee of reminder memes uh, to get the kids to return their books. And you've seen them. You've seen these library book return memes. I just put them on a slideshow. And sometimes this will buy me a little bit of time, if, especially if I'm working by myself. I'll turn this slideshow on if I need to do something or I need to speak with a teacher for a few minutes. I'll have this slideshow running in the last few minutes of the class or the first few minutes of the class because it allows me to step away from the students, talk to the teacher, or talk to my assistant if she's there that day. And it keeps the kids engaged. And what you'll notice, especially with younger students, is they will read the slides 
allowed because that's what they do. And it gives them focus and it's very entertaining. The other one, and this is intended for really all ages, is a meme slideshow which has uh, sort of evolved over the years. And you have most certainly seen many of these images. But these are images that I use when I instruct, and these are images that I use sometimes just to make a point with my students. But if I need some time, I will put this on the screen. Um, sometimes I've needed to have a conversation, but oftentimes if I'm by myself and I'm checking books in, I can have this running for a few minutes and it does keep the kids rather focused and entertained. And it really does, especially if I need to collect my thoughts, uh, I will sometimes put this on just so I can uh, do that while I have a classroom full of students. I will also say, again, I will uh, instruct you on another slide how to put these on a on your toolbar as a folder. Now, when it comes to staying organized with my lesson plans, this is the one thing I do pay for. This is a, in my case, I buy usually a three-year subscription. I've, I've used planbook.com since 2012. Uh, if if I, I had a dime for every person I got to use this program, I could retire today. But I'll be honest, this is working in my background of every day. I, I come to school, I sit down, I open up my plan book. I also use the phone app. And this is really helpful because I have always worked on a four-day rotation and I've covered four different schools and I teach 27 different classes, six different grade levels. So having all of that to keep organized and being able to do that on my phone, that synchronizes with my uh, at, with my uh, website on my computer is invaluable. I also value it because when I print these days out for my guest teachers, they love it. You can embed in your lessons links to your Google Drive, links to YouTube, any sort of digital resources. So when you share those with your guest teacher, or in the case of an evaluation, if a if an administrator comes to watch you, you can actually embed the Common Core standards into each of those lessons, and it's done so inside the, the actual uh, website application. So so I pay, I think, $12 a year if you get three years at a time. I did want to tell you, I shared this at the conference. I gave my own sister uh, a subscription to planbook.com when she was going to be going on maternity leave. And the fun thing was she had never used planbook before, but she was now going to be gone for uh, approximately uh, 12 weeks. And so I set up her classes for her and I gave her plan book and then she was able to share this access with her guest teacher and they communicated on planbook.com and not only was she able to, as the teacher, lay out the uh, instructions, her guest teacher was able to uh, record what they had done those days and so you have this sort of collaborative piece going with your guest teacher. When it comes to keeping everything at your fingertips, and I don't know if it's pronounced favicons or favicons, what I showed you on the screen is a actual cut and paste, and I blew it up, of my toolbar end to end. So if you can imagine all of those little icons making up my toolbar every time I log in. And you'll notice, you can see right up there, there is plan book and all sorts of different um, little bitty icons. And what that is, favicons are the little identifier of particular websites or web resources that you use. And you'll recognize some of those. I Up there, I have my Google Store. I have my uh, plan book. I have Google Drive, Google Keep. I have email. I have up there the bubble. That's called Remind. Then comes Follette. Then it's my school district icon. There's Schoology. Wow. I guess I have plan book up there twice. I also have a Dropbox. I have Weebly. I have my library icon, which is my public library icon. Then the H with a circle is Hoopla. And I don't know if any of you use Hoopla, but that's another day. It's a fantastic resource. I have a Weebly web page, so I have my edited page. I also have my own page. Over there, I also have, and I'm trying to remember, 
that icon. I also have, then notice that I also have Go Noodle up there. And I also have folders. And each folder has a little icon next to it because you cannot, unfortunately, make uh, the the folders look pretty, but you can give them a, an identifying icon. So what I did was when I created my folders, I put a little icon, a little, little B and the little rainbow and the little stars and the ideas because I was, I could associate those with my sheets, my drives, whatever. Anyway, I included a link on that page. It's called Supersize Your Toolbar. Learn how to maximize and personalize the real estate of your toolbar. And I know that this looks like it shouldn't make a difference in your teaching, but I'm going to tell you right now it does. Because when your toolbar is pre-populated with all the places you visit on a you know near hourly basis, the fact is you're not searching for those things. You don't have to flounder in front of your students. And you think presenting in front of a, a room full of adults is hard. Presenting in front of a room full of seven-year-olds is worse. They are judgmental. And if you take too long, you are going to lose them. So when it comes to classroom management, this has been, for me, one of the best tricks of the trade. And if you click on the Supersize Your Toolbar, you'll actually see an entirely, like an entire presentation embedded in there. I gave this presentation at a conference uh, last summer, and it really does... It's one of my uh, ways that I keep myself sane because everything is right there. I know where it is. So when I log into my computer, I have everything literally at my fingertips. And all you're doing is when you create favorites on your toolbar, rather than keeping the words associated with that favicon, go into the edit and delete the words because the, the favicon is going to remain on the toolbar and then you can actually drag those. This is kind of fun. I didn't know you could do this. You can drag the favicons and put them in the order that would best ser serve your needs. When it comes to generating folders, that's a little bit of a learning curve. But once you figure it out, you're like, where has this been all my life? And so the combination of the favicons and then embedding folders on your toolbar is a game changer. I encourage you, if you find yourself right now at home because your school is closed, one of the things that you can do to help feel like you are still engaged and you are still using this time to do something other than clean out your linen closet is to look into, say, how to supersize your toolbar. Sit down one night. And start to play around with the different resources you use on a regular basis and then start creating these favicons on your, your toolbar and you'll wonder, why haven't I ever done this before? The next resource I love, and this is fun, is called Flippity. And this helps me with classroom management. Flippity is a free resource. It was actually generated, I believe, by a full-time educator. He's in the classroom. He just created this randomizer using Google Sheets. And it's free and it's fantastic. There's a bit of a learning curve. But I will tell you, it is well worth the time. Again, here is another one of those resources, which on any other normal circumstance, you might be too busy to look at something like this until the summertime or until you had a break. Well, we now have that break. So what I did was I embedded links to my favorite flippities. And these are in a folder on my toolbar. And I use them all the time. The kids really like them. It helps me with classroom management, uh, among other things. So flippity.net is a randomizer, but it also does other things. So I strongly encourage you to go visit the website and give it some time because navigating the Google Sheet and converting it into something that you can access on your toolbar, it takes a little, little uh, practice. But I'll show you what it can do. And you can use all of these right now. The A to Z spinner is fun, especially if you use an alphabet carpet. And this comes in handy because, as you well know, if you work with littles, the 
expectation is that every student is going to get to share at share time. Every student wants to answer a question. Every student wants to tell you about their loose tooth or their mom's birthday. And the A to Z spinner is fun because if you use that and decide, you know what, I'm going to call on a couple kids today. Let's spin the spinner. All of a sudden now, it's not me not picking on students. Mrs. Herman, why didn't you pick me? You didn't pick me. I'm going to use the spinner. (laughs) And this is really helpful because it really does does give you a perfect excuse to just completely let the spinner pick who's going to contribute next. And the kids see the fairness in this because the spinner is spinning, not Mrs. Herman picking. Um, I also include a spinner that has my chair spots. I assign library jobs to students based on the chair they're sitting. And this changes from day to day. So uh, I have chairs one through five, depending on the configuration. Sometimes there are only four seats at a table, but chairs one through five. So if I need jobs done, I'll spin the spinner and say, okay, chair number two, would you go get the pencils? Chair number four, would you pass out the papers? And having that chair spots is kind of fun. I have a spinner for months because when I work with older students, they don't sit in A to Z spots. And if they're at the tables and I want a couple of kids to contribute, I'll do the months of the year and I'll spin it and say, okay, whose birthday is in February? You're going to answer this next question. Uh, I have a nonfiction spinner, which was kind of fun. And I put that up there during checkout and the kids could spin the spinner and it would give them ideas for what they could check out next. I have a favorites one and a favorites two. Those Those two are just a lot of different uh, subjects, and when the kids spin it, it's what is your favorite? And so the spinner has a whole bunch of different options like what's your favorite breakfast, what's your favorite movie, what's your favorite sport, what's your favorite day of the week, Um, and those kinds of things are fun, and I'll tell you how I use those. I have a lot of students who, number one, won't be checking out because all their books are at home, or number two, renew their books so they don't need 15 minutes to check out, or number three, really just like to check out a book quickly and then go talk. So what I'll do is I'll put favorites one or favorites two on the board, and the kids can queue up, tap the screen, tap the smart board, and they can answer the question, what is your favorite? And then either go stand in line to leave or depending on the time, get back into the line. And this is, I would consider this a center for my students during checkout. And it really does give them a place to go, gives them some focus, gives them a place to socialize and, you know, have these focused engagements with their friends and say they talk about their favorites and they spin the wheel and each kid is excited when it's their turn. Library questions is a little more involved and that's probably better for older students and all of the questions are library based and they're really fun because they really do get the kids thinking about aspects of the library. I do like this next resource. This is called freesound.org. And um, I use this for classroom management when I'm using transitions or it's time to line up. A lot of times I'm nowhere near my computer, but it's time to line up. I might be behind uh, behind my checkout desk. And what I'll do is I have... Uh, one of my folders in my toolbar are sounds that I have selected. These are 30 second clips that you can search for using free sound. Hey, what a great activity to do while you're sitting at home during your COVID-19 school shutdown. So freesound.org, they have these clips that you can embed in a folder on your toolbar, which is what I did. And, um, I included three which I use, and my students like these. And if you click on it, it plays a 30-second sound. And you can search for the ones you want. They have big... And when it was time to get ready to line up, I would have a student volunteer sit at my uh, smart board desk and click on the play button, and everyone would perk up. They'd hear this, this noise, whatever sound they had picked out for that day, and they'd no, this is the t- sound that we all had to use to line, uh, get ready and line up. And I had tried for years. I used to carry around with me one of those little um, meditation 
bells. And uh, um, I would sort of chime it when it was time to line up. And unfortunately, I, I probably just wasn't doing this right, but nobody would respond. I'd, I'd ding the chime and uh, maybe a third of the kids would line up and the rest of the class would just sort of continue doing what they were doing. So I needed something that, first of all, incorporated the sound system that we have in the library or the speaker system. I also needed something that I could... Um, vary. And one day I left my little chime in one of my buildings and I didn't have a chime. So I had to figure out something that I could do until I went back to that building to get it. And this was it. It was like freesound.org. I was so excited. And I selected a bunch of sounds I like, and I put them in a folder on my toolbar and I use them all the time. The kids are excited. They're like, oh, can I be the one to do the sound today, Mrs. Herman? And so I tell them, okay, when the clock says this time, press that button twice and all your friends will line up. And so it's a, it's a treat. It's kind of fun, but um, all right, the next one, remind. Now, this is for school home communications. And I'll be honest, when I need to send something out for uh, our remote learning opportunities, I'm going to probably use Remind. Remind is a, a program. It's actually a free app on our phones. And you can use this to, I think you can have up to 150 participants in each class that you create. It's free. And uh, what I've done is at the beginning of the year, I created four classes, A day, B day, C day, and D day. And then you send home an invitation to the parents that they can opt in to receive these messages. So I was finding, especially on a, a, a rotation where library was on an A day, B day, C day, D day, that parents were not realizing what day it was. They'd say, oh, it's Monday. And you're like, yeah, but that's not how we do our, our book returns. It's, it's not every Thursday or every Friday. It's every C day. Who knows what day it is today? So I had approximately 40 to 50 families sign up for each of these days. I have a an alarm on my own device that goes off at 6.30 every morning. And at 6.30 every morning, I send out a remind to that that class, A day, B day, C day, or D day. And I just say, hi, it's library day. And I usually include one of those uh, library book return memes. But I also can use that if I want to send out a link or a web page or uh, some other information like, hey, everybody, I'm sorry, there won't be any checkout today because uh, I have a guest teacher and they don't have access to our circulation software. So I, it's a nice way to be able to communicate with families. The downside side is you're only going to get families who choose to opt in, which means there will be families who invariably don't get these messages. Uh, I did want to encourage people, and I, when it comes to developing your PLN, this is where technology helps us a great deal. And if you're listening to this podcast, you probably also have recognized the benefits to having PLNs on your Facebook, PLNs on Instagram, PLNs when it comes to, uh, you know, if you go on Pinterest. But recognizing social media as a technology which can support us to help us become inspired, to help us get ideas. You know, this really is a place where I have found a lot of great ideas for, for really anything I do in my libraries and my podcasts. Wakelet. Many of you have already discovered just how valuable a resource Wakelet can be to those of us in our profession. I did include a great blog post written by Joanne Boudreau. And if that name sounds familiar, it's because she was a guest on the podcast in September on advocating for our LGBTQ plus students. And I really appreciated her uh, being on the show. Powtoon, this is not a new resource, but it is free and it's a huge time saver when you're trying to communicate with teachers and with families and with students. Powtoon is a movie generator, which reminds me of sort of putting together a Google slide with music and animation. And Again, it's not new, but it is free, and I've used these. This is a little bit of a learning curve here, and you have to be a little patient, as with all new platforms that you use, but I included three examples of how I use it in my program. Uh, I think I've mentioned before, I've switched buildings 
often because of my schedule. And I work with new batches of, of staff. I, and I have created two introductions, one that I show to my students and one that I show to my staff members. And this is just one way that I can use to uh, sort of demonstrate to students who I am and who I am and how I became the, the librarian that I am today. The other one I use is a, is a how I use Powtoon in my programming. We had a bookmark contest we do every year. So the nice thing is once you've created this Powtoon, you can go back and edit it and update it. So it's, it's worth an investment in time from that respect. And then I would take those links and I would embed them in my toolbar. So along with the other uh, presentation tools. When it comes to creating, here is another uh, example of how I embedded a presentation within a presentation, very meta, is Google Draw. Google Draw is my go-to for creating signs, certificates, newsletters, everything. When I go in, into Google Drive, the first thing I open is not Google Docs. And that is because I go to Google Draw. And I, I'm very much self-taught in this respect. So if you go to the presentation that's embedded on there, that is a presentation I have given on more than one occasion teaching people how to use Google Draw. And I included on there templates for many of the things I use in my library. I also included links to some YouTube tutorials. So if you wanted to, during this downtime, spend some time working on Google Draw, if you click on that link, that's actually another entire presentation on how to use Google Draw. I did also include in this conversation about creating shelf signage and certificates and newsletters, Adobe Spark, which is subscription-based. I know some uh, districts will provide that for their educators, as well as Canva. Canva, like many different web-based resources, has a sort of freemium uh, structure so that if you want, you can use it to a limited extent. But if you'd like to pay for the premium, then you go for it and pay for the premium access to Canva. I did include a uh, complimentary audiobooks link. And this is something that's going to require a little bit of follow-up on my part. But in the days leading up to the conference, it I saw something about educators and librarians getting free audiobooks delivered to them. And I still want to work through this because there are a few hoops you have to jump through. But once you get in, I, the next day in my email, I had access to 30 audiobooks all which were new releases, and I was very excited, and then COVID happened, and I was at the conference. And to be fair, I didn't get a chance to really look into it a great deal, but it is legit and worth looking into. So I definitely say give that a, give that a chance. resource I want to show you is about podcasts. And if you're listening to this podcast, you know, I'm sort of preaching to the choir here because you already know the value that podcasts have. My audience didn't necessarily. I couldn't make that same assumption with the people sitting in my audience. So when it comes to podcasts, I did want to go through a couple things with my audience. And that's first of all, uh, I wrote an article last summer for an Australian publication, and I included a link here because myself, my own relationship with podcasts started eight years ago. And again, I, you know, I'm talking to people who have listened to a podcast, so some of this is unnecessary, but I really do see it as a way for me to bridge the gap in my education and in my experiences. And I go into some history with that in that article, if you're interested in reading it. Um, I did also give some caveats because podcasts are not perfect. Um, I did mention some downsides to podcasts, and I think this is worth mentioning right now. First of all, Podfade. Podfade is real. That is where people create a podcast and then, for whatever reason, stop posting episodes. And I do want to mention this because later in this episode, I will give you a resource of podcasts I think are fantastic. And I included the ones which are since become inactive because you can still access the, the archive. 
And in that respect, it's still a resource. It's still very valuable to anyone who accesses it, but recognize that this particular group is no longer posting episodes at this time. So pod fade is real. Um, when things become inactive, oftentimes they will still be accessible and while the information hasn't been updated, oftentimes it's still very relevant to what we do. I do want to mention at this point, you get what you pay for, and none of you are paying for this podcast. So every once in a while you sit there and go, wow, <laughs> that recording is garbage, or gee, she needs an editor. Um, Yeah, see, I don't work with a, a, a studio. I'm not professionally trained. Yes, is this amateur hour? You better believe it. It is amateur hour. Um, we are not professional broadcasters. And I think there was one episode I listed, I think the New York Times podcast had, they listed their credits. There were more than 30 individuals to put together a podcast that we listen to, I listen to every day. And I couldn't believe that somebody would need 30 people to put on an episode and Yet I recognize that I really could benefit from having a staff. It would be lovely to have a staff. I don't have a staff. It's just me. Um, so I broke down the podcasts by category. And I did this because to me, and I explained this in that article I wrote for Australia, I use podcasts for different reasons. I didn't include in here the podcasts I like to listen to for fun. I didn't include in here podcasts that I listen to for news uh, or information, but I did include the podcasts that I listen to when it comes to being a librarian. I do want to say before I begin describing some of these podcasts that I like listening to for my job. Uh, first of all, I've included a Google Doc with this information, so you don't need to be sitting there writing down these different podcasts. I have uh, put this link in the show notes. It's called Recommended Podcasts, and with the understanding that, like I said with Podfade, anytime you recommend a podcast, rec understand that at any given time that podcast may stop or take a break or have a period of time in which they are not actively posting podcasts. I also want to say that um, this information, while current right now, I don't know. Uh, I'll, I'll try and keep it up to date. What I did was I uh, created a sort of resource so that you don't have to write these down. You can just visit this page after the uh, episode is over. But I did this by category because I think we like to listen to podcasts for certain reasons. The first category is general education. And I found that these are very helpful because I am a teacher. I am a teacher who teaches more than I ever have in my life. I teach 27 classes over the course of a certain, you know, a certain rotation. And I, I think that that really does say something to the individuals who go into this profession thinking, I'm tired of the classroom. I don't want to teach anymore. That's okay. I'm just going to go be a school librarian. That's garbage because all of us know that we do so much more teaching. The difference is instead of teaching 24 kids, you're now teaching 700. So um, I do include a lot of general education podcasts because I like to learn strategies that are used in the classroom and apply them to my library circumstances. So probably Probably the, the one that most of you uh, already know about, The Cult of Pedagogy, with the host Jennifer Gonzalez. And I don't want to read off their description, but I do want to tell you, in this resource, I have embedded the description that they use on their, their uh, whether it's their website or their podcast host, I've included that description in this resource. So you can see what the description of the podcast is when you look at this resource. I also want to explain why I didn't include links to these episodes or to these uh, podcasts. And that's because depending on your device, whether it's iOS or if it's an Android, you're going to use a different pod catcher. And we all have different pod catchers. I mean, some are more popular than others, but to include a link to a pod catcher really isn't important. What is important is that you use a podcast app on your phone and then search these podcasts by title. Uh, sometimes you can also search them by, by the, the host. Um, but including a link doesn't do much good because not everybody uses uh, an, an iOS, not everybody uses an Android. 
The second uh, Gen Ed uh, resource is Teachers Need Teachers, and the host is Kim Lamprey. And I did, like I said, I included descriptions to these, but hers seems to be very oriented towards new teachers. Uh, the Spark Creativity teacher podcast. And this is for English language arts. And I see that there's a lot of, because she does focus a lot on literature and on books, there's a lot of overlap with what we could do in the library. And so I really enjoy her episodes. Um, some of these, I will say, some of these podcasts I have binged, some of these podcasts I have listened to every single episode, and some of these podcasts I've listened to a couple. And I thought, you know, if I I would go back and, and pick and choose if there was something I, I saw I liked from their archive. And that's something that I explained to the audience when I was giving this presentation. You know, the nice thing about podcasts is you don't have to subscribe. You can cherry pick, as, as it were, to the episodes that speak most to what you do every day. Uh, Empowering Educators podcast with Gretchen Bridgers uh, is also Gen Ed. Podcast PD is with three educators. And it is kind of fun sometimes when you get a, a podcast with several people because they're all chiming in and you're getting a lot of feedback right there in those episodes. Um, another gen ed that you might have heard of is Vicki Davis's 10 minute teacher podcast. And these are roughly 10 minutes and it's a real solid sort of concentrated bit of information on a singular topic. And so that makes those kind of fun because you can sort of scroll and pick just the topics that she's going to uh, talk about. Um, Angela Watson has a truth for teachers podcast. I've listened to a little bit, and I think that it would definitely resonate with some listeners. Creative Classroom with John Spencer is another gen ed uh, podcast, which you might find helpful in uh, working in your libraries. Next, I want to talk about ed tech. Ed tech seems to, there seems to be like this proliferation of ed tech podcasts. And it gets a little harder to narrow these down, in my opinion, because if you are ed tech savvy, you are more likely to consider working in, on a podcast than say somebody who does not uh, find themselves immersed in technology all the time. Um, the, the ones that you probably have heard of would include the Google Teacher Podcast and Shake Up Learning. And these two, they have Casey Bell in common. Uh, Matt Miller and Casey Bell do the teacher, the Google Teacher Podcast. And if you're Google, if you're using Google all the time in school, this is really a fantastic resource. I also use TOSA's Talking Tech, and a TOSA, if you're not familiar, is a teacher on special assignment. And Tom Covington and Michael Jepcott are great, and they give a lot of ideas about technology. Again, not in the library, but technology in the classrooms, and then you can apply them to your library. Jake Miller created the Educational Duct Tape podcast, and I've listened to quite a few of those. Um, Shooks, and, Shooks and GIF. Uh, this is These are fun. It, two can Canadian uh, women who created this podcast, and I love listening to them. I've seen them. It, they, they came to Detroit to present last summer, and I really do like listening to their take on uh, educational technology, and their back and forth is really fun, and it, it does make me wish sometimes I, I had a co-host. It'd be, it'd be really fun. Uh, Brian Briggs and Chris O'Donnell do check this out, and this is a California team. They are really um, giving a great deal of information. I, I want to, I, I listen to them and I, I always have to go back to the show notes to make sure that I'm uh, getting some of this information because they've got a lot of great ideas. I did include two podcasts about STEM and STEAM and makerspace. And Chris Woods, who is a Michigan educator, was at McCall and was presenting down the, the hall from me. And he is great. He has the STEM Everyday podcast. So STEM and makerspace and all types of really great ideas. Tori Cameron does the Steam Up the Classroom podcast. So I, these are two that if you are looking to focus on your makerspace and Steam and STEM lessons in the library, 
I think this would be a good place to go. The next category of podcasts, I I sort of distinguish the ones made by companies, they're corporate, they're made by uh, publishers and distributors of books versus the individuals like me who are doing this because of our love of, you know, insert library or love of books, love of authors and illustrators. So this next batch are podcasts which are created by corporations. The first one done by Overdrive is called Professional Book Nerds, and they do book reviews, obviously, and uh, these are for Overdrive, so it would be ebooks and audiobooks. Harper Collins has a podcast called Remember Reading? Question mark, and. Hi, this is one that I'm going to go back and I will binge because what they've done is they take classic books and then they uncover the story behind them. And when I say classics, we're talking about books I grew up with. So I'm looking forward to doing that when I have some downtime. Little and Brown have a podcast called LB School and Library Podcast. And they don't give much of a description, but they do have some great resources when it comes to book reviews. Scholastic Reads podcast. Um, again, you know, when it comes to these corporations, these publishers, they have, you know, access to these authors sometimes when nobody else does. So you take these, these fantastic books and then understand their publishers have like first dibs at doing an episode with them. So when Scholastic interviews their authors, oftentimes these are the authors whose books are being purchased at the Scholastic Book Fair. So it's not a bad idea to listen to the Scholastic Reads podcast because they're going to feature the authors who your students are going to clamor over those books during uh, book fair. Uh, Publishers Weekly has Kids Cast, and this specific Specifically, I, I was interested because I this was one I'd, I had just learned about, and it is both children's and YA authors. And again, it's a publisher, so they're going to have this opportunity to interview these hard-to-get authors about their books. Barnes & Noble has a podcast called The uh, YA Podcast, and I like this because it specifically focuses on YA. And, uh, you know, I the last two, I also have one called Bookmarked, and Bookmarked is is a blog post or a, and so it's nice. I, I think I tend to focus so much on resources for younger students. And if you are uh, middle grade and high school, having podcasts that address YA would really be helpful. Then we get into another section, and these are podcasts that are done by those of us who love books, oftentimes educators and school librarians and people who work with kids and books every day. So this next group, these are not corporations. These are individuals who have created a podcast out of a love of literature and working with kids. The first one is by Nick Patton, and it's called Picture Book. And I obviously dedicated to authors and illustrators of picture books. And really, it's been around for a long time. I want to get more familiar with this because it has a lot of great interviews and a lot of fun to listen to, especially in this downtime. Matthew Winner, I, I'm guaranteeing some of you have seen his, his podcast. I've seen two podcasts, which he's working on, the Children's Book Podcast and Kid Lit These Days with Book Riot. Matthew Winner does a phenomenal job. And it's sort of like the Midas touch. Everything he does is amazing. So I really have gotten a lot of inspiration myself as a podcaster with this, the success that he's had as a, uh, a podcaster. And, and he does multiple podcasts. So really fun. Kid Lit these days doesn't come out nearly as often as children's book podcast. Um, the next podcast is inactive, and but I, I there are 22 episodes. I found them all to be valuable when they, they came out. Anne Braden is an author, as is Sadia Faruqi, and they have a podcast. It has 22 episodes. It's still available to everybody called Lifelines, Books That Bridge the Divide. And it's really unique because it, it looks at cultural uh, issues and how our students can use these books to identify. And is, I really think that it 
brought while they were prod- podcasting a lot of great perspective to literature and book reviews. Um, and they were thematic. They were, and that was sort of fun as well. Um, I will go back and say Kidlet these days is all thematic as well. So you take a theme and then build a book list around those themes, which is very timely. And uh, I, I appreciate that. Travis Yonker and Colby Sharp do the yarn. And um, this is great because they have this magical access to authors and illustrators and they really do ask the questions that if you or I were sitting across from this person we would love to ask uh, uh, books between this is another inactive uh, podcast but I love 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 middle grade all middle grade literature Karina Allen really inspired me when I was considering taking up uh, the uh, podcasting because I felt that she really did speak to me as a librarian. She's a fifth grade teacher, and she was able to bring so much in how she talked about middle grade literature. And because she's a teacher, she was able to see her students respond to these titles and how she worked them into her classes. And it really was, I do value all the suggestions that she made because she was working in the classroom and talking about how her fifth graders love these books. Um, Kitty Feldy's Book Club for Kids. This is kind of fun. If you want your own students to be on a podcast, I did this with my students. You can actually reach out to Kitty Feldy and there on her website, you can actually submit uh, a request to be included on an upcoming episode. But she has, uh, it's really a different way to learn about books, but it's very helpful because what she does is she has kids talking about a book and then she has a celebrity reader who will also talk about and do a reading from the book. And so I find this to be very helpful because you're hearing kids talk about the books, which in many cases are already on my shelf. And as I mentioned to uh, probably in several episodes, I don't have a huge uh, sort of wealth of knowledge when it comes to literature. I, I consume information. I am not a consumer of books. So when it comes to catching up and helping me with my reader's advisory, listening to book reviews and people talking about the books that are either on my shelves already or are books I'm looking to buy, this is one way that really helps me sort of fill that gap in my own um, experience because I don't have a, a lifetime of consuming books to say, oh, when I read this and I read this and I did, because I really didn't. I'm reading them now. I'm listening to them as audiobooks. But sometimes listening to a podcast is going to help me be a better uh, librarian when it comes to readers' advisory. <music> I love Kidlit Women. Kidlit Women is a hundred episodes, and I'll tell you why. Because I listen to all of them. Um, it is pr- it created by Grace Lynn, the author, and it is a podcast of interviews. So there, there were interviews and and essays. The essays were written. Uh, in response to some questions about women in uh, children's literature and gender issues, not just women, but gender issues in children's literature. And so I believe it was 50 authors responded with their own essays. So what Grace Lynn did was she had each author, one episode would be the author reading the essay. And that's going to be a very short episode, less than 10 minutes. And then the next episode would be the interview that Grace did with the author and talking about what they said in their essay. And I I really diving in and, and It was a great conversation about gender. And yes, I would love to do an episode on gender. I'm just wondering how I would do an episode on gender in our library collections and not devote 100 episodes to it because that's what Grace Lynn did. Um, The library in his own, the next uh, series of uh, podcasts are all about libraries in general. Uh, The first one by the New York Public Library I listened to is The Library in His Inn. American Libraries does a podcast called Dewey Decibel Podcast. Some of you might be familiar. Um, Steve Thomas does one called Circulating Ideas. And this podcast has been around for a while. The Librarian Interview Podcast. And I again, it's really great because it addresses libraries as a larger entity, not just school libraries. Um, Behind the Circulation Desk is one that's done by Houston librarians. I only have their first names, Shelby and Jimmy, and they talk about uh, all things library. Lastly, and selfishly, this is where I find 
I get a lot of inspiration, and that is podcasts about school libraries. So yes, this is a little little self-serving, and I'm not going to lie. But um, we have a couple. One is called Checked In, and that's a Missouri Association of School Libraries um, librarians. And really, twice a month, they have great episodes and all things that have to do with school libraries. And they they interview school librarians from all over the state of Missouri. And I really think it's a great opportunity to get a lot of uh, people's insight on the issues we do in the library. The Biblio Dames uh, is a pair of librarians who work in a high school in Fort Worth, Texas. And their names are Nicole Graham and Jenny Stafford. And again, I, first of all, hugely jealous that they work as a team uh, in one library. That just sounds amazing. Um, and then they, they podcast together. And I got to tell you, if you are a high school librarian, you should be listening to this podcast because these two have phenomenal programming suggestions. They do so many fun things in their library and they talk about them and they also post them on Instagram. So if you're a high school librarian, I would make a point of subscribing to the Biblio Dames. The next one is called Don't Judge a Book by Its Cover. And this is a podcast for future ready librarians by the Metro Nashville Public Schools Library Services. And again, they are interviewing their librarians and it is a great opportunity to get feedback from a whole bunch of librarians in a district. And I really think that's great. There's uh, another podcast called Not a Rocking Chair Librarian by Zoe Midler. And uh, the description in this was conversations and ruminations on the shifts taking place in K-12 librarianship and libraries. And while I haven't listened to all of these episodes, I've listened to a few and I think it's worth checking out. Uh, another one of which you probably have seen is by Dr. Laura Sheneman, and that is the Library Influencers Podcast. And Dr. Sheneman has great interviews with her guests. And, you know, I really do appreciate her angle because I do see that she's got all these great ideas and especially about developing your PLN and, and taking charge of your personal development. And that is something which I think all of us need to do. And it's a message that we should all hear. Another episode, uh, podcast would be Overdue Conversations from the Library. And this is one that's really fun for middle schoolers because these are three middle school librarians. And so, you know, I think from a programming perspective, it's great to hear people who teach in the level that you're working in. And I can't do that. I, I've, I've always worked elementary. I'm going to try to bring in voices from the middle school and the high school as much as I can. Um, but when it comes to listening to people who do your job every day, if you're a middle school librarian, this is going to be a great podcast to subscribe to. Wow. That was a lot. <laughs> I, um, I apologize for throwing all that information at you. On the other hand, I don't feel very bad because not only do you have the Google slide of the presentation I just gave, you also have the Google Doc, which is, and I'm not kidding, seven pages long of all of those podcasts I just described with the name of the podcast, the host, and the descriptor, and the intended purpose or audience for that podcast. So I don't feel too bad. I'm hoping that this podcast episode was particularly timely as many of us around the world are finding ourselves perhaps a little bogged down with all the things that are a little out of control. If there's one thing I can guarantee that I'll be here next week with another episode for you. I'd like to thank you for joining me today. Please be sure to visit the show notes and links and all the resources mentioned in today's episode. If you found today's episode helpful, please share it out with your team, your PLN, and on social media. The topic of our next episode will be elementary programming and nonfiction and my interview with Wendy Garland. I hope you will tune in. Mm-hmm.